everybody. Welcome to another episode of Global Health Talks. This one today's, I think, going to be fun. I have a good friend who's agreed to be on the show. I, um, and I think she's going to talk about some interesting things that have global implications. Uh, so at that, I would like to introduce you to a familiar name, Nikki Eisenhower. And Nikki, welcome to the show. Uh, we're, we're absolutely delighted to have you. And we're also delighted to provide you with the chance to expound on something that I know is very, very near and dear to you. Um, first, first things first, who are you? Tell us who you are in 25 words or less. Ever evolving. Uh, I am a biomedical communicator that uh, makes me a lover of innovation across many medical fields uh, and a researcher as well. I find myself delving into various conditions, especially in autoimmunity, uh, the military medical uh, conditions that are specifically related to deployments some of which don't happen on deployment, which is pretty interesting. They happen afterwards. Uh, so there's, that's, that's me. I, I'm military family. I'm a former military significant other. I get a little bit involved in some other parts of things that you might like, like Intel and things like that a little bit, like your mom. So yeah, yeah. I, that's, that's me. I'm a, I'm a little bit of uh, a a jack of all, a lover of all trades, a participant in none, but passionate studier and promoter of the best. Well, you know, thank you, Nikki. I, I think you have a lot of very interesting um, observations through that to, uh, to uh, uh, give us. Can you tell us what is this thing called AIMS, A-I-M-S? Well, thankfully, it's not only my brain. The whole idea behind AIMS is collaboration. So you asked that question just beautifully, Mike. Uh, having noticed that we had a great deal of disconnectedness in the military community, the whole thrust behind AIMS is to bring us together as individual professionals with knowledge and as in any other professional organization you show up as see, professional organization being keywords right there we're like an american medical association or a business league so you show up as your intelligence and not necessarily your practice you're not necessarily you're not representing your branch or your hospital system you, you are you and your your contributions, and that that was a it has been a hugely lacking uh, convening space in in our community. Well, thank you. I mean, <clears throat> now we've sort of gotten to the solution ahead of the problem. So, what I really want you to expound on, if you can, is what are the challenges that traditionally, and then we'll get to the later challenges with recent events and whatever, but what are the traditional challenges that confront the military when transferring back into civilian society? That has been an evolution, Mike. It's never been easy. There was a time when our service members just didn't talk about it. Yeah. That was back yeah. when people called it things like shell shock or battle fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. And to be very clear, trauma and transition issues are not the same thing. They're not mutually exclusive either. They're two different things that can most certainly exacerbate each other. And so as we've come through World War II, where everybody, I mean, World War II, we were, we actually 
drafted people who were 60 years old or younger. Everybody went. So yeah. everybody who came home understood it. All the family members understood it. Then here we have Korea and Vietnam and how we treated those veterans. And then there was a big gap. And you, it's hard to think of a time in history where there's lack of conflict as causing problems for our veteran space and veteran support. But what it did was it broke the continuity. So the, the Vietnam veterans were treated likewise by the, v, by the VSOs, by the veteran service organizations like American Legion and VFW. They were treated by those organizations the way they were treated by the public. They were shunned. They were kept out. That's why we have Vietnam Veterans of America. They had to advocate for their own. Uh, well, so then we had a big gap. And so it, it just evolves and evolves and evolves. It's a very psychologically jarring experience because you come yeah. from an independent life. You grow up unfettered. And then at some point, either electively or by drafting, you're brought into a setting where you're told to engage exactly the opposite psychology. Put on the uniform, lose your individuality, here's your gun, um, and you now take orders. And honestly, for some, that can be a wonderful discipline for then returning to civilian life and going into business. There are many, many successful military people who come back into business and are absolutely thrilled and delighted for a, a brief uh, stint in the service. However, for many people, they seem to be lost. They seem to, this is too much to go from freedom to dedicated service and back to freedom without so much as a thank you. And um, so I guess if you could, I, if you could extrapolate a little bit further out, Nikki, what are some of the international implications now, uh, without overly politicizing, but, but discussing, right. for example, Afghanistan, um, what are those unique subset of issues that really, really are screaming for an organization like Ames? Ooh. Well, that's, that's where, when I say, what in the world is it that I'm supposed to do? People say, you, lady, you tell truth to power. That's your job. <laughs> okay, great. We're happy to do that. We're, this is your chance. Go ahead. Tell truth to power. The reality is we have five branches in our very own military. And they, are, they have their own specific raisons d'etre. They have separate uh, mission statements. So their orders and their functions are not the same and their experiences are not the same. And there is almost no way to shoehorn this into any sort of a model, except to say that every veterans and service member and family members experience is different, very different, different from one deployment to the next. So the thing, the, the one constant is the lack of constant. And this I believe is the biggest barrier that we have not only in the military community, but in our, in our, in our daily community. In our community in general, we need to look at each other as, yes, possibly somebody you could fit into a mold based on some sort of assumptions about their background. But at the end of the day, that's a unique experience right there. And so we, across the world, you know, you, you just asked about Afghanistan. Having allies, this has been We've taken a quantum step backwards. I'll be frank. I'll be really honest. Um, the, not necessarily the fact that we've pulled out of Afghanistan, but the, the, the abruptness of it is, and those who have been left behind. 
this has taken a massive toll on our military community. We are ripped up about this. And how are they, uh, Nikki, if I, I apologize for interrupting, um, how is the military community at large, how are they reacting or are they artificially silent just because- Oh they're... no. What, I am so proud. I am so proud of our former special forces uh, groups. There are a number of groups that are doing different, uh, planning different operations and fundraising to help get people out of Afghanistan who have been left behind. And that's a beautiful thing. That's, that's we the people, that's what it says. We are supposed to be doing right there in the beginning of you know, the preamble to the constitution says to, we, that we are each responsible to provide for the common defense. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. to see those groups reconvening and saying, what isn't getting done, we're going to find find a way to make this happen. And that's so so is Ames great. is Ames, and I'm I'm just trying to put something in a category which may be ever, ever evolving, but is Ames a glorified American USO is Ames. No. Wait, 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 wait. Is Ames a political lobby? Um, is Ames a a comfort station? Because Ames, when it becomes what it is going to become, and there's probably no greater test for your organization than right now, because yes, everybody everybody is feeling some sense of embarrassment uh, and is trying to judge different sides of the coin. But one thing is absolutely, absolutely for sure with the dynamics of this world, Afghanistan will not be the last of these stories. And uh, military personnel are going to have to get some kind of a comfort level on what their participation is uh, so that they can feel good about participating. So what what if in your world of worlds, if Ames could have a tagline for what it does, what's your tagline? I think we foster a high level of medical diplomacy and our raison d'etre more than anything has been to bridge that gap between the military medical systems to though there being two of those obviously the military health service which is transitioning from being the defense health agency into being the military health service but that's actually a really good thing. And it's taken too long. Most mm. people had no idea that we had three surgeons general, one mm. for the Navy and the Marine Corps, one for the Army, one for the Air Force. And then you had your surgeons, your surgeon general for the general public. So then you had the, and those surgeons general didn't engage with the VA. So creating the Defense Health Agency in 2015 was a quantum leap for this space, but we are still, we're still at the baby steps level. And COVID has unfortunately not helped anything because there's just so much research. It's, it's monumental and you can spin it almost any way you want to Whatever it is you want to prove, just about anything you want to prove for COVID-19, you could prove from the body of endless research that's out there. But this is not the first time our service members are fighting a scenario where we've left our allies. We've been unilateral an awful lot, and that is morale crushing. We are a NATO member. It was my cousin who commanded NATO for the first yeah. time. For no, the no, no. But <laughs> we were we were a NATO NATO member, Nikki. That 
we pulled out of that much to the chagrin of the rest of the neighbors. And the reason for that was that we were paying more proportionately than anybody else was. It's not fair. And I'll just give you a little personal commentary on that. I think you belong to the organization where you can do the most good and where it does the most good for you. And you sort of worry about what it costs later. I mean, that, you know, that to me was really surprising. Um, and I do know, yes, that there are many, many other instances beside Afghanistan where veterans are kind of left to hang out to dry and fend for themselves when they get back. So everything you're doing with the organization is beautifully spirited and it's very, very well intended. And I hope that with this exposure that maybe we can get some ears in Washington and locally to start realizing that it's not really war that we're bickering over. It's the sacrifice of those who fought the war and how can we say thank you? And so far we're not saying thank you. So- uh, Well, we're not saying thank you. We need to say, we need to support it while it's going on rather than saying thank you. Uh, saying thank you is actually not well received by a lot of people. Um, I heard General Mattis actually had a great response to when someone says- yes, Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. And I love this, I love this, I love this. And I hope that it has two effects. One, we often hear people say, well, it's, it's just my job right? I, I was doing my job. That's true. But then I love his response. It's say you're worth it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Say you're worth it because two things happened there. One, it is a, it's a generous response. It's not a response. And if that person hasn't been worth it, they might stop and think a little bit about whether or not they've been worth the fight. Am I worth the fight? That person just told me I was worth fighting for. Am I, stand, am, am I living up to that? Because that's how we think. Of course. You come home to a civil society, not where somebody flips you off on the highway, you know, or doesn't let you into traffic or, whatever grumbly bumbly thing it is to yeah. open ourselves up and understand and see the thing of it is is for our service members they they know everybody bleeds red you cut and red comes out yeah yeah and so when we start talking about who paid more who paid more all right well let's just talk about it this way do you know who lost more service members per capita than anybody in the United States? American Samoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk about blood and spoils, percentage of population, they lost more lives than anybody else. So, so I'm okay. with you, Mike. You right. cannot okay. measure it. By, yeah. You can't measure it in dollars. Yeah. You have I to know. measure it in integrity. And this is a good place for us to cook, uh, finish. Not really finish, finish, but this is, this is good to get the information out, Nikki. And um, I certainly hope, and you're doing such wonderful justice to that name, which is a name that is recognized by every baby boomer. Um, and um, uh, thank you for all that you're doing. And hopefully at some point we'll have the opportunity to visit with you again and learn of some of the new successes and uh, some learn new, how some new missions improved. coming up. Yeah, yeah. Some new missions coming up potentially. That you will want, be. You want to tell us very quickly about any new missions that are coming up? Just well, I'm thinking about spending a little time supporting those Afghanistan missions. Okay. And uh, coming up with some some ways to actually 
stay connected and do positive things, you know, regain a sense of being that beacon of hope and not having left and not having abandoned. And uh, there's actually someone who is a service member who's actually got a, a person who's still back in Afghanistan and is in danger. And I look forward to reporting to you that he's been safely brought home. And so those are some of the things that are happening little Nikki, by little. Thank you. Thank you for the goodness of your soul, the kindness of your heart. I know that in addition to doing fine work, you are a great believer in this cause and I commend you for that. And uh, we want to see you come back soon. I'd love to come back. I, I thank you so much for this opportunity and your passion for this. Your, your family goes back a long way. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot, of soldiers, well, so. a lot of soldiers in that family. Yes, you do. I bet you there's right. a few sailors, sailors, <laughs> air, airmen, posties, yeah, possibly everybody, also. Everybody. There we go. It's been a, an absolute pleasure, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. 